As new revelations are reverberating across the political landscape after the third public hearing on the January 6th Capitol attack. Meanwhile, a framework for new gun regulations is beginning to splinter as senators try to turn their broad agreement into a detailed plan. That brings us to the analysis of Capehart and Gerson. That is Jonathan Capehart, associate editor for The Washington Post, and his colleague at The Post, opinion columnist Michael Gerson. David Brooks is away. Welcome to you both. Nice Hi, to see I'm you. Not. Thank you. Great to see you. So let's start with those talks in the Senate. A bipartisan group of senators we know have been close. They say they have a framework when it comes to gun violence prevention. Uh, those are led by Chris Murphy of Connecticut, of course, John Cornyn of Texas. But just yesterday, just yesterday, John Cornyn walked out of those talks saying this as he walked out. He said, it's fish or cut bait. I don't know what they, meaning Democrats, have in mind, but I'm through talking. So, Jonathan, could the talks fall apart once again? Yes. They, yes, they can. How many weeks have I sat here on Friday saying, I'm happy they're talking. It's great that they're talking, but I'll believe it when I see it when we, get, when we go from talks to press conference to um, passage of the bill to signing. The fact that Senator Cornyn has walked away from the table is the least surprising thing. Um, the announcement of the framework on Sunday was really hopeful. Mm -hmm. And in fact, there were a lot of things on there that Democrats thought, wow, we didn't think that they, we could get this as part of the framework. But the fact that Senator Cornyn is saying he's done talking and it's time to fish or cut bait, well, what's the issue? I mean, does he have a problem with the boyfriend loophole, which is what a, a lot of the re reporting is? Well, what's your proposal? Um, we have to keep in mind that it's not like Democrats haven't compromised. If Democrats put forth all the stuff they wanted, an assault weapons ban would be in it. So many other things would be in the framework. But, but Democrats have made it clear, we need to do something. The fact that Senator Cornyn is walking away from the table, it, it, quite sadly, more of the same. So, Michael, this, uh, Jonathan's right. The reporting is that it's this, this boyfriend, closing the boyfriend loophole, the keeping guns away from right, abusive right. partners. That's the sticking point for Republicans and John Cornyn. There's a lot of stuff in here. There's funding for school safety and mental health, background checks for states to pass and bolster red flag laws. So what does Cornyn walking away do? Well, I, I agree with Jonathan. This is an incremental bill. That's the way it was designed. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, what's, what's in there, um, my fear is that it would not do enough um, to, to kind of address these issues, and then you would still have some difficult problems. Um, but it does matter that Mitch McConnell has at least um, provisionally endorsed an approach like this. Mm -hmm. um, and that gives kind of permission to a group of senators, I think, um, who are in more purple states and some of them running for re-election, that they w may want to have something to say about a problem, a, you know, a huge moral problem. We need to remember the context here, which is the murder of children. Right. Um, and, y you know, I think that Cornyn looks bad um, uh, because he's ignoring, essentially, the moral imperatives of our moment. But Cornyn also got booed, we should say. Today he was speaking at a Republican convention in Texas. He brought this up, that this deal's in the works, and he got booed. What does that tell you? Well, this, this was a pretty hardcore audience, I assume, of Texas Republicans. <laughs> um, but, it's, you know, there is some risk in any deal. On, you know, my concern, though, is that we were, we were moving towards a deal on criminal justice reform, for example. Um, and it fell apart. Um, and I'm afraid, you know, that that may happen in this case, um, although I think there are some, uh, not yet. All right. Well, I want to move on to the January 6th committee hearings, of course, because that was another big week with two more hearings, public hearings on the books. They now have three hearings behind them, three more, we believe, to go. Each of you actually shared with us moments that stood out to you. There was a lot of information in those hearings. I want to play for you those moments and get you to react. Jonathan, you remembered this moment from former federal appellate judge Michael Luddig. He'd been advising Vice, uh, Vice President Mike Pence that Pence couldn't do what Trump wanted him to do, which was throw out the election results. Here's just part of what Luddick said. I would have laid my body across the road before I would have let the vice president overturn the 2020 election on the basis of that historical precedent. 
that is Judge Michael Ludig. I apologize, I mispronounced his name. Why, why did that moment stand out to you? Judge Ludig is a giant. He is a giant among um, conservative lawyers. Um, his reputation is, I'm trying to think of the, the liberal equivalent. Um, you don't get more senior and more revered than that. The fact that he said he would have thrown himself in, the, to, in Vice President Pence's way to stop him from doing that um, was pretty incredible. But the other thing he says that we did not show was that he had a warning that Donald Trump and the folks who follow him present a, quote, clear and present danger to our American democracy. This is no liberal Democrat who's talking. This is no just, you know, rank and file Democrat talking. This is a tried and true, dyed in the wool conservative jurist who is saying, ringing the alarm about this scheme that Eastman had come up with, that they were trying to get Vice President Pence to go along with, and who is also saying, they're not done. This scheme is not done. January 6th, he didn't say this part, but I'm saying this part. January 6th is a rehearsal for what we could see in 2024. Michael, I found it interesting. Most of the folks who testified, most of the people we heard from were Republicans. Um, and you recall this one moment that stood out to you where we heard from um, chief counsel to the vice president, Greg Jaca. We, got, we learned a lot about what Mike Pence was doing on January 6th, how he was down in a secure location, continuing to work, even as rioters outside were chanting, hang Mike Pence. Here, here is a moment in which Greg Jacob was uh, talking about what happened then. Does it surprise you to see how close the mob was to the evacuation route that you took? The 40 feet is the distance from me to you, roughly. I could hear the din of the rioters in the building while we moved, but I don't think I was aware that they were as close as that. Make no mistake about the fact that the vice president's life was in danger. Why did that moment stick with you? Because it's something we shouldn't get used to. I mean, we had a moment where, with a, with a mob intent on harm, fed and, and uh, pushed by the press sitting president of the United States against his most loyal lieutenant. Um, and it was a near run thing. Um, you know, this could have been the murder of the vice president. I mean, how would that, how would American politics have responded to such a thing? Mm -hmm. And, you know, what, one thing that came out in the hearing is that during this, as it was happening, um, President Trump was tweeting pressure tweets attacking the vice president for lacking courage as this was happening. Um, and that indicates to me, you know, a reckless regard for not just his political future, but his life. You know, this is a president, uh, I think we learned again, but it's the most dramatic example. This is not just a corrupt politician. This is an evil man an amoral man. And that, I think, is, you know, important as we come around to the next election where, you know, he's the Republican frontrunner. That is a, a dire situation for the Republic. Jonathan, there was another moment that stood out to me uh, when we heard from uh, communications between Trump's lawyer, John Eastman, um, sending messages. He's the one who's recommending sort of a plan for how to do this to overturn the election results. And the committee basically shared that he emailed saying, I've decided I should be on the pardoned list if that is still in the works. Uh, what, what was your reaction when you heard that? Well, I, I mean, my mouth was, was agape. You only ask for a pardon if you know or feel that you've done something wrong. I, I would never ask for a pardon. <laughs> right? You Why? What have, I done? what have I done? Right. But Eastman knew. He knew. The, the, the committee showed that he knew from the beginning that what he was proposing was. Right. Uh, uh, <laughs> this is public television. I almost <laughs> went there. What was not right? <laughs> was 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 not right? And so he pushed it, pushed it, pushed it. And then after January six, he sees what happened, and then says, "I want to have give me a pardon." It, it's. We still have we still have three more hearings to go, I should say. And there's already been so much evidence laid out by the committee. But Michael, do you see do you see a world in which they, they end the hearings, they wrap all this up, and there's no action from the Department of Justice? Is that a possibility? 
Um, it's, it's a definite possibility, although the Department of Justice made some noise this week, mm -hmm. essentially saying, we'd like those transcripts, the ones that you have of these witnesses, um, because there is a parallel investigation going on um, with the committee and the Justice Department, and they've started stepping on one another's feet a little bit. Um, but that does show that the DOJ is looking mm -hmm. closely at what's happening in these hearings, um, which I, I regard as a good sign. Um, there's going to be tremendous pressure on, uh, on Garland to do this. Um, but I, th I think it's going to be a very tough choice for them because it would set a precedent of pursuing criminal charges against former presidents that we've never really had before. Um, we'll see. Do you also think Mike Pence should testify? We haven't heard from him. I would have loved to heard him. Yeah. Um, about all this, and you know, but he has tried to, you know, get as far away from his action, his own actions, as he possibly could, because he still sees a path to the presidency that doesn't exist. <laughs> we will see. Three more hearings, as I say, to go. Before we let you go, Jonathan, I do want to get your thoughts on this, because ahead this weekend, Sunday is Juneteenth. Right. It is just the second time in our country's history we are marking this day as a federal holiday. And I just wanted to ask, and as the country notes this day, as we mark it together, how, how are you reflecting on what it means this year? Well, I'm reflecting on the fact that there are school districts and states that would make it difficult to even teach what Juneteenth is about, simply because, you know, some parents offended that the word slavery is used, that people were, were enslaved and worked for free and were tortured and all sorts of other things in the creation and the building of this country. Uh, you know, we just saw in Buffalo, African Americans targeted by someone um, who is a believer in the, the um, Great Replacement conspiracy. Juneteenth gives us an opportunity to talk about th this nation's foundational wound that we still refuse to talk about, that we still refuse to, to confront. And so, you know, we're in a moment in this country where Juneteenth, if a lot of these folks get their way, very well just might be a marker on the calendar with no explanation about what it means and why it's important that we, we commemorate that, that holiday. Let's hope we don't waste that opportunity. Thank you for that. Jonathan Capehart, Michael Gerson, thank you so much for being Thank here. Good you. to see Thanks you. So much.